Wonderful. Thanks so much. And good afternoon, everybody, on a Friday afternoon. It's amazing to see so many people coming out to hear about how to write an argumentative essay. So that's my topic for the day. I don't consider myself <coughs> a guest at SATS. Uh, SATS is very close to home, but it's wonderful to have so many of our staff, our students, uh, and probably a few who are uh, real guests to SATS joining us this afternoon. Martin Luther famously said, if you want to change the world, pick up your pen and write. And he did a pretty good job of that, <laughs> picking up a pen and writing. The ability to write persuasively lies very close to the heart of good theology. In fact, theology is to a significant extent about writing. It's about grasping the inspired texts God has given us and then thinking through how they fit into new contexts, how they speak to new challenges. And all the time that we do that, we try to frame our thinking clearly and convincingly. And a, and a big part of that, of course, is writing. So my topic for the day is how do we write an argumentative essay? And I'm going to spend most of my time on the how component of that. A uh, few preliminary things before we get to the how. And then once I'm done, I'll leave some space, God willing, for questions. I hope to show you uh, an, an imperfect example of some of these principles in place. Uh, and then we'd be happy to engage around workshopping one or two topics if there were um, interest in that. So let's begin with the two kinds of writing. So broadly speaking, people who talk about essay writing would classify four categories of essays, expository, argumentative, descriptive, and narrative. And of those, two are dominant or prominent in theological writing. Those two kinds are expository essays and argumentative essays. And they're very, very different in nature. We are talking this morning specifically about the argumentative essays. So let me run through a few ways that they are different. They are different in terms of their purposes. The purpose of an expository essay is to inform the audience about a topic. Typically, it'll be a topic that is not particularly controversial. And so the idea is, is informative to help you understand something. Textbooks, typically, would be informative writing. Um, by contrast, the purpose of argumentative writing is to persuade. In other words, to, to convince the reader that a particular solution to a specific problem is coherent, is convincing, and is the best option. Which means that your perspective when you write in these two different ways is quite different. When you write an expository piece, you're not particularly dealing with a controversial topic, and you're not nailing your colors to the mast, so to speak. So you try to take a objective, neutral, um, dispassionate stance towards the subject matter. By contrast, when you write an argumentative piece, you typically write it from the perspective of one who is persuaded and is trying to persuade others that a particular solution to a problem or a particular position on a debate is the best one. So different purposes, inform versus persuade, give, give rise to different stances vis-a-vis -vis your subject matter. You're either attempting to remain neutral, or you're making no pretense of being neutral, you have come to the conclusion that one position, one argument is correct, and you're trying to persuade your reader. That's what's happening in argumentative writing. Both of these have identifiable subtypes. I see three subtypes. Depending on who you read, you'll get different classifications. This is my own classification. I think that expository writing basically falls into three categories, depending on what kind of theme an essay unpacks. So you get what themes, how themes, and why themes, and we're not going to spend any time on those this morning. 
Similarly, you could have anywhere from two to five subtypes of argumentative writing, but, but they're all quite similar in reality. The two that I've listed, a lot of argumentative essays will tackle a problem and present and argue in favor of a preferred solution to that problem. So it's a problem solution uh, framework. The alternative that's also very common is a, a debate position argument. In other words, you enter an established debate and you defend a particular position as best you can. Now, every essay should have a thesis statement, also called a proposition or a main claim or a central unifying idea. It goes by all kinds of different names. But the idea is that there should be one statement in an essay that captures the very kernel truth that you're attempting to present. And that thesis statement will be different in an expository from an argumentative essay. In an expository essay, the thesis statement presents the main point, and it will typically be a concept. By contrast, and this is absolutely central, the thesis of an argumentative essay would present a main claim. You make a truth claim. It's your argument. It's the thing you're trying to persuade your reader to believe is the best solution. Now, I've read quite a few of our students' essays on particularly undergrad work. You will search long and hard to find a thesis statement in a typical undergrad SATS essay. We, we just seem not to have this well taught, perhaps through our schooling or through our educational background, it's often completely missing. But it is the very epicenter of a good and convincing piece of writing to, to state your claim very early on as a thesis statement. And then there's a different framework for paragraphs. When you're writing to inform, a paragraph will have an explanation followed by support. When you're writing to persuade, you'll present evidence and then explanation or analysis of that evidence. And so the, the building blocks of the two different kinds would be fairly different. Now, while we're presenting two different kinds of essays, in terms of their centrality to the, the undertaking of theological dialogue, discourse, etc., and I use theological in the broadest sense of, of our entire exploration of all things related to God, ministry, mission, etc., the, these two are, in my opinion, unequal in importance. And the argumentative form of writing is, it's simply the better option in most cases. It is the yardstick by which theological debate and discourse progresses and moves forward. So while both are important, they are not equally important. Argumentative essays and argumentative writing. A good journal article in the humanities is invariably an argumentative essay, just of a very highly developed and slightly longer form. Now, why? Why is argumentative writing so useful a skill to master if we are spending our energy on studying God's word and ministry applications of it? I would I'd suggest three reasons. One is it cultivates the crucial skill of critical thinking and clear argumentation. And this is useful not only for theological debate. It's really useful if you're having a dispute with your wife, for instance. A very practical skill to have in a marriage. I'm joking a little bit, but, but the truth is it's a skill that's applicable to all of life. The ability to look at a complex problem think through and come to a conclusion that you believe provides the best solution and then present that with the purpose of persuasion is an incredibly valuable life skill. So it's applicable to all of life because it cultivates these core skills of critical thinking and clear argumentation or clear communication. When it comes to people involved in ministry endeavors like preaching and teaching, the ability to take a stance and defend it convincingly is really, really central to ministries like preaching and teaching. So cultivating the skill is transferable to much of our public ministry platform. And then for those who want to move from foundational to more advanced forms of theological study, 
it's a firm foundation for more advanced studies because the more one progresses to advanced theological studies, the more central argumentative writing and case building becomes. A thesis essentially being uh, an extremely long, complex version of the same idea. So against that background, let me, let me talk about how. So how do you write a good argumentative essay and i'm going to suggest that there are five call them steps if you wish maybe they're processes they're, they're not necessarily sequential although i've tried to put them in the order that would be most natural to follow the opening task is to formulate a central claim so one has to read widely think deeply and when you've done enough of that you come to the central claim that will unify and be presented in your essay. That's the hardest part, actually. But that's also the first critical step. The next step would be then to, to unpack how you build the case. So, so we're talking about a, a courtroom type environment, really. How do you make your case to persuade that this central claim? is how the jury should vote. So you build or articulate your supporting arguments. Then you compose your body paragraphs, um, write an introduction, which should introduce the problem and the proposition. And you conclude with a review and an exploration of some ramifications. So I'm going to unpack each of these five steps um, in a little bit of detail. Firstly, Step one is that we need to formulate the central claim. This is absolutely the most important step. To do it well, you have to have developed a good and broad understanding of the subject, and you have to have come to a conclusion on a disputable issue. So we're talking here about our argument. So the argument of the argumentative essay, your thesis statement, your, your central claim, is your argument. And a good argument has five characteristics listed on the right hand side of my slide, assuming it's visible. I would define an argument with at least three of them involved as a supported by evidence. And three of my five characteristics of an argument are built into that little definition. Uh, firstly, it's a truth claim. When you write an argumentative essay, you are arguing in favor of a particular view that you hold to be legitimate, valid. And you are trying to persuade whoever's reading your, your essay that your understanding is reliable. Um, <clears throat> where was I? So it's a disputable truth claim that we make. And there are five components of that. Firstly, it's a truth claim. So you're claiming that a particular viewpoint on your subject matter is the best, is the most plausible, the most credible, etc. That's first. Secondly, though, the truth claim you make must be disputable. Otherwise, you're not building an argument. You're simply stating the obvious. So if you're going to say, my argument in this essay will be that the earth is round, since presumably almost everybody would agree with you, that's not an argument, that's just a statement of fact. In order for it to be an argument, it needs to be a claim that people would contest. The issue that you're contending is disputed. So disputable truth claim. Thirdly, it emerges from a debate in scholarship, meaning that the the contested space has something to do with a debate in the existing literature, with a contested claim in the existing literature. Okay. Fourthly, you're going to support your truth claim with evidence. So if you can't muster evidence that would argue and persuade in favor of your truth claim, you probably don't have an argument. All right. So the last thing is that an argument can only deal with something past or present. You can't build a case for what will be because it's not yet happened. 
the implications and ramifications can't be supported by evidence. They can only be speculated, etc. So five characteristics of an argument. <clears throat> This is useful to me. It comes from uh, Belcher's book. She quotes Stephen Possuta, Possusta, who suggests that a nice formulation for introducing the argument is although, or something like, although others argue that, I will argue, so the nevertheless is generally not stated. You know, In contrast to those who claim that this is the right answer, I will argue in favor of the following position because. And this is presented in an argumentative essay as the kernel thought, typically in the introduction, in a way that spells it out um, fairly clearly and concisely. So in stating the thesis and framing the central claim, a few things to bear in mind. Paraphrasing the question is not a thesis. So when you say in this essay i'm going to and you basically paraphrase the question that you're addressing that's not a claim that's just restating the question the thesis is your answer to the question so i'm going to argue that such and such a view about women in church leadership is the most compatible with etc um, stating the topic is not another common mistake. Someone will state their topic. You know, I'm going to write about this and this and this. That's not an argument. That's just a statement of your topic. Listing the steps you're going to follow. Now, in the first section, we'll cover this, and then we're going to ask and answer that. That's not a thesis either. Your argument is the answer to your question. Stated typically in one sentence, it'll have a subject and a complement. In other words, what I'm writing about and what I'm saying about it. So I'm going to write this about women in church leadership. That's a topic. In order for it to become a thesis statement, you've also got to include what you are saying in some kernel form about the subject. And then once framed, that thesis unifies your entire essay. Your entire essay is designed to build the case for the truth of that claim. Step two is to articulate the supporting arguments. So once you've got a central claim, the question becomes, what are the things that persuade me that your take, your view, your interpretation is the most convincing explanation. Those are your supporting arguments. Whatever they are, they are the reasons that the reader should accept your thesis as the best explanation. Now, if we look at argumentative essays by length, a short argumentative essay would be an essay of probably a thousand words or less typically often with five or six paragraphs. They, they typically don't need headings because they're too short to, to really work meaningfully with headings. In that kind of space, your first paragraph is an introduction, which I'll cover just now, but it's gonna introduce inter alia, your main truth claim, your proposition. And then it would have about four or five, maybe, sorry, three or four typically body paragraphs. Each paragraph of the body is one argument for the main argument, one supporting argument. Uh, well, they're arguments or refutations of counter arguments. So that's the other category. And then the conclusion ties it all up in some fitting way. In a longer essay, each of those components are still present. They're just unpacked in greater length. So it's not one paragraph for each section, but probably an entire section builds one argument, and then the next section builds the next argument, and so on. But the basic structure remains similar. The introduction states your thesis, your claim, your main divisions, whether they are paragraphs in a short essay or sections in a longer one, contain the supporting arguments and or refutations of alternative explanations and then the conclusion ties it all together. I've done this on the assumption that there might be three sections with two of them being arguments for your position and one being a refutation of a view that you're rejecting. Um, so that's one way. 
They don't all have to be like that. Here's another way of looking at, at this. You have a thesis statement, which goes in the introduction, and then you list your supporting arguments and or refutations. <clears throat> and my recommendation when you're planning an essay of this type is that you actually write out each of these as one complete sentence, not a paragraph, one sentence for the thesis, and then one sentence that articulates each of the supporting arguments that you're going to build. Once you've got that, you've got the embryo of your entire essay. All that remains then is to unpack it and present your evidence. So I recommend that you write these out as single full sentences in the planning phase. And then when you come to your essay, if it's a shortish essay, each supporting point will be the topic sentence of one paragraph, which is typically the opening sentence of that paragraph. In a longer essay, each of these statements becomes the, the central thrust of a section of the essay. Step three is to compose the body paragraph. So once you've, and you'll notice here, we are suggesting, I am suggesting, that you're writing the body probably before you write the introduction and conclusion. So you've got an idea of what the introduction and conclusion is because you framed your main unifying thesis or argument, but that you actually unpack it by writing the body paragraphs first and then doing the introduction and conclusion at the end. Remember, the entire undertaking is to try and persuade your reader that the, the position you're championing is the best explanation of the topic. And your paragraphs serve that purpose. I'll suggest four ingredients in developing a good argumentative paragraph. The first ingredient is that you start with a topic sentence. So in other words, your opening sentence states the argument in support of the main argument. So you're not stating a piece of evidence, you're stating the, the primary argument in support. So we should accept the main truth claim, this is reason one, the next one would be reason two, um, or it states a refutation. But that the opening sentence of each paragraph, generally speaking, would be the statement of a supporting argument, a key, key point in your essay. This is assuming a, a fairly short essay, not whole sections. The next thing you put into that paragraph is your evidence. So evidence is why I should believe it. Give me some concrete reason to believe this. There, there are four primary types of evidence in academic writing, uh, quantitative, qualitative, experimental, and textual evidence. And we mostly, unless your study is based on some kind of field research, we mostly in theology and other branches of the humanities are dealing with textual evidence where we would have primary sources and secondary sources. Primary source is the primary source material about the, it's the text you're studying. In our case, often it's the Bible. But if one was studying Karl Barth, for instance, your primary source becomes Karl Barth's writings. And then secondary sources are experts who have written about the topic or primary source material. And so for us, typically the evidence is an analysis of the text to show how it supports the, the argument being made. So you present the evidence, in our case, often it's textual evidence. And then because evidence doesn't speak for itself, you have a little bit of explanation of how that evidence um, supports the point that you're making for it, uh, how that is the right interpretation, etc. Remember, everything's about persuasion. And then lastly, you move to the next paragraph with some kind of bridging so it's either summarizing the gist of this and or bridging into the next argument. So some kind of a transition to soften the, the switch from one uh, idea to the next one. So a team structure, start with a topic sentence, present your evidence, often it's textual evidence in our discipline, then present some discussion, your analysis of that evidence to make its, um, make how it supports your argument clear, and then transition or move to the next paragraph in some appropriate way. Now, once you've done all of that, you have the nuts and bolts of 
your essay written. What remains is to introduce it and conclude it. I'm assuming that you've done your referencing while you've done your writing. So the last two components that we likely write are the introduction and the conclusion. So our next task is to introduce the problem and the proposition. <clears throat> now, again, these are anything but intuitive skills. Uh, and typically, the, the average quality of an introduction to a typical piece of student writing is usually fairly, fairly weak. The typical introduction would, would introduce a topic. Now, I'm going to write about this. I'll give you the three views on the structure of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, in section one, I'll talk about A. In section B, I'll talk about B, etc. So, so you basically got this meandering um, introduction of what I'm going to talk about. But it doesn't tell you what you're going to say. It doesn't position the essay as an argument, etc. What should be in a good introduction? I want to suggest three components to a good introduction. And I really got close to putting a fourth one in. So I'll throw that in for good measure at the appropriate moment. But maybe three and a half building blocks for a good introduction to an essay. In a short argumentative essay of somewhere around a thousand words or less, this is one paragraph. And it would have these components. Firstly, your first task is to introduce your topic by contextualizing the debate. In other words, you want to frame that there is a problem. There is a bone of contention. There's a current dispute or debate. Remember, our argument is a disputable truth claim, and it's in relation to a current debate in scholarship current debate in, in, in the state of the art. So we are coming into something that's already a contested space. And we begin our entry into that topic by briefly contextualizing the debate. Now, in a short essay, this is only a few sentences. But it should least, at least give the idea of these are the, 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 this is the debate. These maybe are the key viewpoints in it. And you are entering into that problem with what you believe to be a contribution or at least a motivation to believe a particular stance on it. So you first contextualize the debate. I'm going to write about the end times or I'm going to write about rapture theories. That's not contextualizing anything. That's just stating a topic. Contextualizing the debate would be to give some sense of the the yeah, the contested space and, and how and why it's a contested space. Once you've done that, you state your thesis. So having said, this is a, a debate that's happening, you then position the key claim that you're going to argue in relation to that debate. So you nail your colors to the mast and you state your argument. I'll give you an example of that momentarily. The half item that I was tempted to include but didn't is a claim for significance. So you might want to put in here, why does it matter? Why is this critical? So, so you could build that in. That's not currently in my framework. And then the last item would be to preview the approach that you're going to take. So you've stated the argument you're going to make. Give me some headline as to how you're going to make and build that argument. Um, so some kind of a preview, overview, indication of method, etc. So when you write your introduction, especially for an argumentative essay, it's not a meandering, um, claimless statement of the broad subject area you're going to write about. Rather, give me a forceful presentation of what the issue is that's contested, and then state definitively what viewpoint you're championing vis-a-vis -vis that debate, and then briefly give an idea of how you're going about establishing that your view is plausible. And lastly, you want to conclude. And this is a tough area. It's a tough area of sermons. 
and it's no less difficult in the sphere of writing. And one I've only learned about recently in any way that's actually helpful. So I was looking back at some of my previous attempts at argumentative essays and realizing it would have been really helpful if I knew some of these building blocks a few years back. Um, but typically landing the plane is the hardest part. Not uncommon uh, for a, a sermon, for instance, to either have the pastor circling the runway endlessly trying to figure out how to put the plane down um, or to just suddenly crash land, you know, just end. Uh, and probably the latter is more common in most of our academic writing. You know, it's just like we end abruptly or we end with a almost pointless restatement of content. So, so our ending is nothing more than a brief summary of the key points made. So, so some suggestions about what could go into a conclusion. Um, Wendy Laura Belcher, very good resource on academic writing. Uh, she says the introduction declares the significance of the argument. The conclusion declares the significance of the article. We'll give that a moment to sink in. So in the introduction, you're trying to paint a portrait of why does the position I'm arguing provide the best explanation for this debate that's happening? So you're declaring that your argument matters, that it's the right position, it's the right viewpoint. When you get to the end, you hopefully have made a case, a persuasive case, that your argument is the best way of understanding the complexity of the issue at hand. And the question then becomes, so what? Or perhaps, what now? So you've built your case. Why does this matter? And how does this matter? What is the significance of this argument that I've hopefully persuaded my reader is true? And your conclusion wants to bring some insight into why the article, i.e. why the, the concluded perspective matters probably in the real world. Four ideas to, to build into your conclusion. And in short essays, these have to be very short. So there isn't a lot of space to do them. But anyhow, um, certainly in slightly longer essays, if you're writing a journal article, for instance, you have enough space to do fairly good justice to these four components. The first one is a review. And yeah, what you want to do is you want to restate your argument in different words. This is the summary part. And it's ideal to do it in different words so that you don't bore your reader to death. It is a sin to bore people with the word of God. So we need at least to try and be interesting and one way to do that. And also to reinforce the point made is just to use slightly different phraseology. Now, for many of us, our conclusion ends with review. I want to suggest three other elements that you should include in many of your conclusions. The next two anchor around a distinction that I found in Belcher, which is the distinction between the internal outcome of the article and the external outcome of the article. What does she mean? The internal outcome of your essay or your argument is how well does the argument, how well does your piece of writing make its case? Have you effectively and convincingly um, made a conclusive case for your key point? So you're, in a sense, assessing the convincingness of your own argument. How conclusive is it? The external outcome is the so what question. So if that's true, what implications does it have for theory and practice? And it's often advisable to include these elements in wrapping up an argumentative essay. So reaffirmation is really to affirm that you've made a good case and maybe to give some self-reflection on how conclusive that case is. And then the epicenter of the conclusion would be exploring some ramifications, i.e. the implications of the article. So reaffirmation is evaluation of the article. Ramifications are implications 
of the argument or the article. So what, if this is true, what are some of the ways it should affect the real world or should affect theory and or practice? And it's desirable to have some of that reflection built in to the conclusion. You can't introduce new arguments, but you can reflect on the so what and what now questions of your argument. Nearly done. And then lastly, end with something that makes the key point memorable. So end with something powerful that, that sort of consolidates the takeaway. You're trying to make your last closing sentence or thought, maybe it's a poem, maybe it's a powerful quote, but it should be something that leaves your reader taking away from this article that which you hope would be impactful to them. So four elements or components that one might build into a conclusion section of an argumentative essay. What kind of ramifications could you include? Briefly, you might use the scrape method. Um, solutions, you know, how does this solve certain problems in the real world if it's true? Uh, consequences, what, what are the consequences of applying this? How might we respond in personal ways? What are some of the applications we could make? Um, predictions, pardon the typo, uh, but what predictions? How does this help us to understand predictively what might happen? Or exhortations, um, <clears throat> exhortations to action in the light of the argument that's been built. Those are just some of the ways. There's probably others. So in conclusion, the Theology is about writing, uh, has always been, if we want to make a difference, learning to write <clears throat> persuasively and convincingly is a core skill, not only for academic work, but also for just about any kind of public ministry, and indeed a skill that's useful and transferable to all of life. And this is a learnable skill. I think much of what I've summarized as building blocks of an argumentative essay is not intuitive. The ability to write well academically is, is actually something that's more learned than innate. So by practicing these skills, you will be able to become more skilled at them and hopefully get better and better as time goes on. So my encouragement is practice this. Do it intentionally. Give it a trial period. I recommend 30 years as the trial period for applying the method and then if it's not working for you after 30 years, maybe change something. Uh, and then to our staff who are present, because these are not intuitive skills, they're skills that we need to be helping our students and ourselves to acquire as we go along.